Hi, I'm Alex Vitale, professor of sociology at Brooklyn College. Welcome to another episode of The Critical Criminologist. My guests today are Aaron Roussel, associate professor at Portland State University, and Luis Danielle Danny Gascon, who is at University of Massachusetts at Boston, and they are the joint authors of The Limits of Community Policing from NYU Press. And I'm very happy to talk to them about this book, which has added a lot to the conversation about community policing and also about what's going on in Los Angeles, where neither of you are at the moment. But uh, <laughs> so why don't you guys give us a little bit of an overview of the book? Um, the book is a, is a, a really quick look at like a cross-sectional look at the police community relationship in a particular part of Los Angeles, and at the same time, the sort of complications imposed on that by the challenges and the changes of the demographic population in, in South LA, so the Black and Latino population. Yeah, we delve into history, especially of LAPD, um, and we sort of assess where they're at, what they're doing, what sparked community policing there, and what it looks like. Great, and did you come into the project initially knowing it was going to be about community policing or were you interested more broadly in what was going on with police community relations and did you know did you have some ideas about community policing going into this go ahead no you uh, okay uh no honestly um i don't think this was either of our intended areas of study when we first got to graduate school, um, but because of uh, projects we got sucked into, we ended up working on um, we ended up working on a project on in interracial violence. Uh, a lot of the quantitative work had already been done, uh, and they asked us, uh, two professors at UC Irvine, asked us to go and do some qualitative work. Um, and you know, life kind of happens. You meet the right people, and suddenly you're going to these interesting community policing meetings, and you're like, oh wow, this is a whole thing that needs to be studied, right? I mean, we, you know, there's not much in the literature on it. Um, you know, there's a lot of theoretical statements. But when we started doing our research, like literally nobody had sat down in those meetings or studied it from the ground level, you know? So Dan, I'm sure you have things to add. I understood yeah. what it was very much even on the ground. I mean, like Aaron said, our, our, initial, our, our initial questions were really about sort of gang conflicts even um, with the, the the two professors that we worked with were interested in understanding gang conflicts. And because there was a lot of black Latino conflict uh, conversations happening in the public and in the media, uh, these two professors wanted to understand that. They asked us to do interviews around the community. And the more that we did that, the more that we asked questions about black brown conflict, the more that people sort of encouraged us to look at these meetings because that's where most of the black brown conflicts emerged. Um, we started to have conversations with members of the police uh, department in a particular neighborhood um, and we got connected through uh, those same faculty members who had uh, had previous projects through um, the university and we started doing interviews of police going to more meetings meeting um, residents in the community people who were leaders in various community organizations and then it, and then com questions about the community policing came after i, I mean i don't think any of us either of us really had a solid idea of what it was. We were sort of learning it innocently, objectively, kind of just as a member of, of the community would, like a member, like a civilian. You know, we would read what the policies were, we would read what the rules were on paper and then see what some of the disparities were in action. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the, maybe what you're reading is skepticism came up for sure, if, at least from my, from my end. And, and just to add on that, yeah. sorry, just, just sorry, to add on, uh, wow, I can hear myself as an echo. Um, you know, I, uh, at the same time, um, I was very involved in uh, the graduate student union at the UCs, right? And we were taking the lead on some of the big um, refund California, cut tuition, like, you know, some, some stuff that brought us into some serious conflict with police. So it was always interesting to to put on one hat, you know, I'm even wearing this, we were UAW and they're holding it down right now, uh, looking for COLA increases and they're doing it even even through the COVID crisis. Um, they're doing a lot of good work, but you, it puts you 
you know, right up against that police line, right? And so that's a, you, you put off, you take off your researcher hat and you put on your activist hat and, you, you know, you go back and forth, you know? So that was also happening, at least to me, uh, during during some of this. So you get to see multifaceted, uh, you know, kind of sides of the issue, right? Yeah, I mean, some of my uh, interest in policing came initially through the issues around political policing through through my own activism uh, long before I got involved, let's say, in, in the homelessness work, et cetera, that, that played a big role in, in shaping a deeper analysis about policing. But the initial skepticism, yeah, came from, from uh, political policing. So... Um, you all were both at Irvine, was right? Was so? Was there was there anyone on the faculty there who was do, who was doing policing stuff? Did you have someone to help guide you through that part of it? I mean, not directly. We had we both had faculty members who worked with uh, LAPD and other LA area um, law enforcement agencies, but no one who was studying policing. The two faculty members who I ended up working with on my dissertation were both cultural anthropologists. You know, one of them studied immigration processes uh, among Salvadoran uh, undocumented immigrants, and the other was a, a gang researcher. So they were both very much like street and organizationally oriented. Um, and I think they gave me and us in a, like a, a grounding in, in ethnographic techniques, but not on policing at all. Yeah. We discovered some of the... It's funny, uh, after we started presenting our research and going around and, and talking to people, you know, with, as the bulk of the project became, started to be over, you know, we met a couple of people who'd been in the field at the exact same time, you mm -hmm. know, Sid Martinez and, and Forrest Stewart and all those guys who were doing that, some of that work. Some folks were working with the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, right? It would have been really interesting. I wish now, in retrospect, we'd been able to convene, like, a whole bunch of junior scholars who were doing that kind of research on the ground level in LA at that time, because it would have been really interesting to share resources and talk to each other about what we're finding and stuff. But a lot of that emerged afterwards, you know. Interesting. Yeah, Forrest is going to be on the show soon to talk about his, his new book about Chicago. Um, so let's let you mentioned that there's, you know, a history section to the book. So tell us a little bit about the relationship between community policing and a history of crisis within the LAPD. Yeah, so you you highlight specifically in the questions you sent uh, the the Rodney King riots, and and that definitely helps us to understand what set the building blocks for community policing as as it's known today. Right? The the Christopher Commission and things that came even before the outbreaks of of the riots helped to define what the community meetings would be, what's uh, what some of the institutional goals would be. Um, even though, as we point out in, in uh, the first chapter, there was there were a lot of specific elements about the police community relationship, such as the role of the senior lead officer that were defined in, in the 1970s, not even not even after the 1990s, um, that had been repurposed just to satisfy the public's um, discontentment with the status of the police in the uh, in the community at that time. So, but but really, what what's what the chapter is about is sort of situating police reform as solely a response to crisis. You know, we, we highlight three rioting events, Rodney King, uh, Watts, and uh, the 1942 Azutsu riots, as it's known, um, as these moments where the police department in LA is sort of highlighted in the public as problematic for X, Y, and Z reason. And and the riots are very central to sort of opening up why that is and, and sort of uh, highlighting the, the examples of brutality, the, the role of institutional racism more broadly, but also the, the sort of changing racial landscape of Los Angeles and how those things came together to create the situation. Um, and and it, it, in, at the end, uh, what is, is really helpful in understanding the significance of these three periods is, is sort of like looking at the four different domains. And this is sort of what was helpful in, in, in drawing from your work, Alex, was uh, highlighting the, the four different ways that police reforms have uh, occurred as a result of those changes, right? You look at how training evolved over time. Um, you know, there was a much more specific emphasis on, on changing like specific practices on patrol for police over time. Um, if you look at uh, the ways that they were 
these different commissions were uh, promoting diversity. Earlier on, it was about hiring more Chicano cops in the mid-century and later century. It was about hiring more black women and, and gay officers, right? Just these uh, larger groups of, of, uh, of demographic groups that had been marginalized by the department uh, in, in different periods. Um, a greater focus on accountability over time. You know, uh, earlier on, there was not much discussion about the formal mouthpieces that the public would have to oversee what police were doing. Uh, in the 1960s, they started to have this conversation about the creation or the implementation of an inspector general, something that was carried over again in the 90s. The Contemporary Police Commission in, in LA today is, is still premised on that uh, model. But again, that's not something that came into, into the picture until the mid-century. And lastly, uh, community relations, how that, how that evolved. Over time, it was focused on Mexican youth, uh, in the mid-century and later, it became um, more broadly focused on on just youth of color, and then and building tighter relationships with specific community leaders um, over time. So, um, so like I was saying, that these these three events really help sort of paint the picture of how community policing isn't born just from Rodney King, even though that's often what's said. Um, but it really it, it it really has to do with all of the institutional changes that have happened over time in the last century. Spe uh, specifically because of moments like the Rodney King ride. Yeah, I, I want to just build it up because... <laughs> no, go ahead. What? I said, I hope that wasn't too long of a walk. Sorry. No, no please. Well, and so here, here's the thing, right, is that the initial draft of that chapter was about 80 pages because we wanted to go way back. We wanted to go back to the uh, Mexican-American War, you know, and talk about the L.A. Rangers and talk about, I mean, the fact that, you know, at the end of that war, you basically have this low-level war conflicts still going on, right? And you have armed groups of Anglos going around, you know, with badges or without badges, you know, engaging in land stealing and all kinds of things, right? They eventually morph into more official organizations, right? The LA Rangers, California Rangers, right? I mean, all of these groups are quasi-official sort of proto-police, but they're also militaristic, right? They're there to conduct um, land expropriation. They participate in, in various lynchings, Right. I mean, they are, uh, you know, once you reach a certain level of industrial development, you that's not productive anymore for capital. Right. And so the instantiation of LAPD becomes a way of sort of regularizing that kind of repression, you know, at the, at the end of the 1800s. Right. And we didn't go there in the book, but the initial chapter did go there. Right. And so, I mean, Danny's points are all well taken. Right. There's there's you look back at the McGuckin Commission. Right. The commission that responded to the Zoot Suit riots. You look back at the, um, the McCone Commission. Right. Which responded to the, um, the Watts uprisings. Right. Watts Rebellion. And you see things which could easily be labeled community policing if that language had existed. Right. Um, so 92 is a moment where community policing is a concept that's being used to organize all of these things. But like, he's, like Danny said, it wasn't born then. It was then tied to federal funding, for sure. It was then tied to the threat of a federal consent decree, for sure, right? But all of the seeds for all of those pro projects and programs, um, many of them re were reanimated under that, that umbrella of what we now call community policing. Well, unfortunately, we, we also have Kelly Lytle Hernandez's book, City of Inmates, which has been able to also give some of that, that deep history uh, and Good. Max uh, Cantor's book um, on on the LAPD also gives us some that. So it's kind of a golden moment, you know, of research about LAPD. So why why did was the main reason for choosing the the project that you you've been doing this research and you were in the Los Angeles area? Is yeah, that, I, I mean, choosing the least, LAPD. Um, I think it just it, it sort of arose organically. You know, the, these were the connections that we had originally. I think in the back of my mind, setting LA is personally significant because um, a lot of incidents in Southern California. You know, you go back, you go to the 1992 Running King riots, the the incident with the OJ afterward. You know, these kinds of moments were very significant to me as I was growing up as a kid. You know, shaping my worldview, but not only. That helping me understand sort of the role of criminal justice in everyday life, um, I, so I think those kinds of things were very interesting to me. But also the fact that we were 
right near the epicenter of the riots was was also a very significant moment. Hi, Kat. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bun Bun has arrived. How did you manage access to the to the community meetings to to talking to the cops? Through the department well, itself, we got to know a um, an assistant chief, and he was the one that put us in touch with the area captain. Um, we probably out of everyone in the de department, we had our closest relationships with the two captains, three captains that we ended up working with. Um, we got to know the slows to varying degrees, and some community members we got to know really well too. You know, we would visit their homes or their businesses. Um, but but it was mostly through the meetings and through working with cops initially uh, that that really helped to sort of set the foundation for our relationships later on. And I think that actually helped to hinder us building some in the community too. You know, us early on when we would try to get interviews with uh, former gang members and, and interventionists, uh, and they had heard about us through police or we had gotten their names through police, they were often unwilling to talk to us or or say anything on record, you know, they would they would talk to us and say, yeah, you know, this is this is what we kind of got going on. This is the the conflicts that we see in our neighborhood. You know, you could talk to this person, you could talk to that person, and we'd be like, all right, well, you know, do you want to sit down for something longer, like on tape? And they're like, no. So that that those kinds of relationships earlier on definitely hindered where we could go, but I think we found a set. I mean, we found a set of dynamics that were supremely interesting to us in the meetings themselves. And we felt, like Aaron said earlier, that there was there there hadn't been a whole lot of attention paid to this kind of dynamic before. Yeah, this is a really hard thing, right? Is trying to manage uh, trustworthiness with either the, with both the police and the community. and And I know that that Forrest Stewart, you know, he made these inroads with the police unexpectedly. In, in his book about Skid Row in Los Angeles, but then he did get some grief from the community folks that he had been working with about, you know, being too close to the police. So this is a really fraught situation for, for ethnographers who want to try to talk about the, the interaction between these two groups. It's almost and like vice versa, too, right? Uh, Go ahead. Well, and vice versa. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Aaron? <laughs> Aaron. Well, and vice versa for Forrest. I'll let Forrest speak for himself, but like I think the cops also gave him some real trouble too. Um, after he went, anyway, I don't want to talk about about his work, but like, I mean, I do, but like, it's not my place to do it. Um, but I mean, I think our strongest relationships, honestly, were with the community members who showed up to a lot of the meetings, and that's an interesting group, right? That's not your gang interventionists. That's not your um, your more radical activists. That's your homeowning, business owning, we want stability, many of whom are explicitly pro-cop, right? So you, but I mean, as we talk about in the book, like I think one of the key moments for us was when the captain we came in under initially transitioned out. A new captain comes in and the community members in the room, um, you know, who are just getting to know this person, they already know us and they're like, oh yeah, these are our graduate students. Like just normalized everything. Right. So now the captain has to deal with us as people the community trusts. It was it was, it was an interesting moment, it was a nice moment uh, where it, it seemed as though we had um, achieved some level of trust with the people in that room who were not necessarily police officers. And it's also kind of a commentary, honestly, on, you know, um, you know, it's a hierarchy, right? Police. It's, it's a job. It's a thing where you're trying to get promoted. And so, you know, every two years, reliably, there's a new captain. Right. Every two years, reliably, there is a switch in the authority structure, um, you know, whereas the community members, many of them had been there for a very long time. Right. Right. So let's talk a little bit about your, your critique of community policing. You know, we think of it as this ideology that says that, you know, the, the problems with policing are that there's too much distance between police and the community and that this can lead to abusive or discriminatory policing and that uh, if the police are more robustly in contact with the community, then they will be able to identify who the real problem people are and the community can identify, you know, what, this, what the problems are that the police should address. 
But you, you point out an, a number of limitations to this, things like, you know, the intelligence gathering and who's the community. So can, can you tell us a little bit about some of these findings? Yeah. Um, if you've ever had a conversation with a police officer, uh, <laughs> and I think maybe the audience will, will, will identify with this, um, they're never wrong. I don't know if you've noticed. They're never, you, you can't teach them nothing. Um, and I'm, I don't say that to cash aid on anybody. I'm just, they are used to being in authority. So they define who the bad guys are. Uh, they'll accept help if they want, you know, um, if they want specific pieces of information, right? Um, but in general, right, there's this, it's kind of a one-way street, honestly. And I'll stop there and let Danny fill in some, some gaps, but I, I have more to say about this, but I, I don't want to get too far afield. I mean, uh yeah, just just as it came to, it's. I mean, in in I think the beginning of chapter three we talk about how the purpose of community meetings the this is supposed to be the holy grail of the new moment in community policing. If those meetings are supposed to be about gaining community input to then um, make adjustments in law enforcement directives, then they would take certain information that the public tells them and then not only change what the what police are doing but change the way that they go about law enforcement altogether. Um, you don't necessarily see that kind of one-to-one -one relationship happening at all, if ever. Um, very rarely do you have a, one person sort of defining what it is a law enforcement officer should be doing. If, if anything, an officer is just looking for justification from a member of the public for something they were already going to do. Um, yeah. You know, the, we we sort of feel like, like speeding has gone up in this area because ComStat figures have told us now Miss Johnson over here is complaining about speeding on that street. So then now we have to put a speed box out there to monitor, uh, you know, certain kinds of beat. That that's more what what would often happen is, is looking for excuses, looking for reasons for, or, or looking for moments of convergence in the interest of the of the police department's abilities and the public's in, you know the public's concerns about what what crime are. Yeah, one of the things. Uh, one of the phrases that kept coming up for me uh, very often, in various ways and, and in different kind of combinations, but but one one officer really captured it, uh, is this phrase called voluntary compliance. What I need is voluntary compliance. Um, and community policing, or the set of practices that comprise whatever that is in the given moment, because as we I think we understand generally, it is anything from slapping community policing on the side of a patrol car to, like Danny said, the holy grail of, of meetings and of maybe co-creating um, some apparatus of safety, right? Um, you know, yeah, uh, that's just, they don't let anybody dictate to them and they don't really want to cooperate. Um, this, a lot of this is on their agenda. One of the, I mean, one of the biggest things you might think that the community could have a say in would be who exactly is policing us. Maybe we can't change the structure, maybe we can't change the tactics, or whatever we can do. Maybe the people that are in the neighborhood, we should have some say over, right? Um, and at the end of chapter six, I mean, we, we talked about uh, there was one problematic uh, sergeant and just everything was tried, right? The backroom deals, the front room deal, like all the, all, of the, all of the discussion went into this, right? And ultimately what happened was that he ended up running afoul of the bureaucracy somewhere and got transferred for other reasons. Um, but all those efforts were kind of for naught, and everybody was really frustrated. They were like, why aren't you listening to what we have to say? Because hiring and firing decisions have nothing to do with you, community. It's about police and their, and their, and their needs and necessary, what's necessary for them, right? Um, and I, and I'll, I'll take this a step further, too. And, and um, when you think about what police are, what they're for, what they do, right? I mean, I think very often what's in the news is they reacted to a situation poorly. Right. Um, somebody who was causing no harm got shot, maybe killed uh, because of the color of their skin, because of what they were engaged in, because they were mentally ill, because they were house, you know, whatever. The litany of reasons. Right. But we think about this as a reactive thing. But police historically and contemporarily also suppress progressive movement. That's one of the things that they do. Right. That's what the Red Squad was about. It's uh, I mean, we, we understand exactly the kind of surveillance and suppression and repression that went on with Black Lives Matter. Uh, code pink even came in for all kinds of surveillance and things like this, right? I mean, so um, this is also proactive, right? The goal is to keep the finger on the pulse of what's going on 
and to have people in key places such that they can speak back against this. It's an ideological game also, right? We haven't said the word legitimacy much yet, but community policing is very much a legitimacy producing program, right? And I'll, I'll let, let it go with that. We can delve into that more as we go, but. Well, and of course, the, not only are they not responsive to the people in those meetings ultimately, but th there's this kind of uh, interesting case where on the one hand, the meeting, the participants in those meetings are not really that representative of the community. So the police are in this interesting situation. See if this, this was my reading of, of what you had, which is on the one hand, they don't really respect the people who show up. They're glad that they're basically police supporters and that their complaints can be easily managed, but they don't really take them seriously. But at the same time, they don't actually want representatives of the real community to be there. They certainly don't want anyone who's going to push back or have an independent base of power in those meetings. So that the meetings are, you know, ultimately so much about nothing. I mean, I, I don't. So the, the the last part, I do. I think that they want to avoid having a. Uh, people in the room who would disagree with them? Yes, absolutely. That's what they want to avoid. They want to have people who are going to just tacitly accept police authority, for sure. But the first part about questions about whether or not they respect the community, you know, I don't think that they, that's more complicated for me because I, I would say that I don't think that they see the community as having any authority to define law enforcement directives. They wouldn't go uh, based on some grandmother's information and then go organize an entire sting operation. No. What they would trust community for, what they do respect community to do is to say, look, we had this, we had this shooting last weekend. We have not turned up any leads. People in that community refuse to talk to us. Can you help us out? Take these flyers around. There's a phone number people could call if they don't want to talk to a cop directly. See if you can get them to say anything because we're just trying to find the perpetrators who did it. That's what they would, that's the kind of law enforcement capacity they would trust these people with. They do respect them. They do care for them. There's many times where these officers would like hug and embrace members of the community because they see them on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. um, they have very close personal relationships, but I think what Aaron says is, is still true that both people walking into that room understand that at the end of the day, the cop's word matters more. But they have a shared interest in, in, in sort of maintaining the relationship. So I think the members of the community, that particular community, are happier having this ability to work with the department and plan community events around the department rather than what happened in the 1960s. Because sometimes these are the same community members who, talked about, who talk about the differences and how this is much more desirable than the way it was. Yeah. I, to build, just to, yeah, I, I don't know if it's going to go here, and I want to make sure it does, uh, so I'm going I'm to answer that in a slightly um, circuitous fashion. Um, uh, we make the comparison in the book, uh, based on some work by Christian Williams, um, in making the comparison between community policing and counterinsurgency. Right, in the same way in which we can talk about militarized policing, right, which is a transfer of social and physical technology from the military to the police apparatus, right? So they, they, they beef up their SWAT team and they have snipers and sharpshooters and bearcats and all that kind of stuff. I think we all, we've all seen that in, in the news and the media. We understand what that looks like and means. Um, the other side of that, and that's the side that we've been investigating, right? That's what we're looking at, um, is the social and technology transfer of the community policing idea to the military. So let's let's take it out of LA for a second and let's go to Baghdad, right? Or let's go to um, Afghanistan, right? And now you have a military that's looking to build bridges with moderate elements in the community. Who are you going to choose? You're going to choose the people who work best with you know not not the not the the most trigger happy, right? People that have good relationships. You take them seriously, but you also have a mission and you have an agenda, and you want them to represent that agenda to the more the more um, you know, the elements that are further away from U.S. occupied control, right? Um, so I think there's a similar set of dynamics going on there. Uh, you know, and, and, and not, not to put the 
too fine of a point on it, but we actually, you know, one of the people that we were working with in the field, one of the officers, got called up to the reserves to do exactly that. He was a community policing officer who got called up to train the military how to do this, right? So, I mean, this is an aspect of it too, right? It's legitimacy building. Um, you, you know, so the people in the room, are they trusted and respected? Yeah, they're there for a purpose, right? And you need to cultivate those people as assets. Um, one of the things we talk about a little bit is uh, the eyes, the ears, and the mouths, right? I think it's old news. It's well-established uh, police science that, you know, we think of the residents in these situations as eyes and ears, right? Um, and as Danny points out, they're not, you know, the the intelligence assets that I think uh, sometimes comes across in that. It, it, his, his point is absolutely correct. Um, but think about it, right? There's a, shoot, a shooting goes down on the street. Who shows up? Some angry people, but also maybe a couple of community members who go to these meetings, who are able to represent um, police perspectives and say, hey, let's wait for the whole story. You know, they calm the crowd, right? They give out uh, police information when they have it, right? They act as the mouthpieces very often for LAPD. And they're, and they're proud to do it, right? They see this as protecting their, na their neighborhood um, and, and interfacing with authority for people who maybe you can't. Um, so, yeah, I mean... You, they channel dissent, right, to community policing forums. Um, here in Portland, right, we had we had this crazy uh, collaboration between uh, this band of neo-fascists in in Vancouver and the police, the Portland Police Department, right. And so there was this whole scandal, and they had all these meetings, right. And the meetings are great, but they attract exactly the people that the police want to keep tabs on, right. We know police collect metadata. We know they know some of the faces in the room. So they're, they're sitting there, they're assessing strength. How much am I going to have to give up to make this go away, right? They're, um, they're crafting strategy as someone is up there taking flack. You know, uh, uh, these are venting sessions, right? So there's a whole reform cycle that goes into this, and eventually activists, you know, get burnt out and exhausted. And if you drag the process out long enough, it's just going to go away, um, which is a long way from what we are talking about. But I, I do think this is part, of the, part and parcel of that larger strategy, right? Well, I think that's part of the critical analysis of community policing, right, is that it has these analogies to, to counterinsurgency, and we can look at the work of Stuart Schrader and Nicole Siegel, who, who've gone out and actually done some hard research about these historical relationships uh, between the, the military counterinsurgency, U.S. foreign policy, and, and domestic policing in a way that's really helpful, and I'm actually reading a new piece uh, by Julian Go that that explores uh, explores some of these ideas. So I'm hoping to talk to him about that uh, soon. So you're turning into a robot. Am, am I phasing out a bit? Hang... Yeah, yeah. But maybe we just hang on for a second. We can get on the same page again. Might just be you, dude. Because I'm oh, okay. Out. Okay. So um, one of the really interesting findings, I think, of the piece of the book is the way in which the police have a view about what the community should look like. They're not just a passive acceptor of what the community is. They're not just picking who they want to be in dialogue with, but they're using police power to pick winners and losers. And one of the concrete forms this takes, uh, you show, was that they have this preference for commercial activity that is chain stores and linked to big brands as opposed to mom and pop shops. And that this is driven by a little bit of a racial analysis, uh, but also this sense in which this makes their job easier in a concrete way. So, so could you run through some of this for us? Sure. Um, and I think it's uh, what chapter five. We we sort of talk about the relationship between the department and and the business community and the few officers that that form the team that that sort of run the most interception between them. Um, probably the the most significant. Um, interactions that we saw came from a zoning hearing the, to approve the construction of a 7-Eleven in the neighborhood. Um, part of, of what you're raising is like the, the sort of moralization that police had about the community, what it should look like, what, what it should move away from, was about them defining the 7-Eleven as, 
as like belonging to an improving future. The community they said in that current moment had come a long way, you know, where now it was beautiful neighborhoods and, and it showed that there was a mark of a fam that families living there that take, took care of the community. And it was a far cry from the pre Rodney King, post Rodney King era that was defined by having mom and pop liquor stores all over, all over the place um, and not much other business. Um, they were arguing that, that these kinds of businesses couldn't contribute to community safety because they didn't have the sort of resources necessary to have the most up-to-date security systems. That was one way they, did, they defined it, right? That um, a 7-Eleven, by contrast, was sort of backed by the franchise name. People recognized that it was a household name. So the fact that it was uh, connected to this sort of uh, broader uh, corporate structure meant that, that this, the business is something that you could trust, right? That you would go in there, they would have a security camera, they would have li floodlights in the parking lot, and it was the kind of place that you could take comfort in going to at any, at any time of day. Mom and pop shops like, were, were pitched by contrast as being somewhere where you risk your safety by going to this place because they don't have adequate security measures. Um, not only that, but the mom and pops, because it was a majority black community are seen as black businesses, formerly and, and so undesirable businesses. So it was like the mom and pops were some, somehow uh, symbolic of danger or the danger that the community used to have. Um, that, so those zoning hearings are probably the, the clearest of that but then, you know, Aaron wrote along with a, with a particular slow who, who was sort of doing this on the mobile, you know, moving from neighborhood to neighborhood, regulating the community in very similar ways. And in the one and in the, the ride along that I went along, the uh, senior lead officer was working with liquor store owners to sort of also create a distance between themselves and certain elements of the community. So there was it wasn't just in a zoning hearing. You know, it also happened as, as officers were out patrolling. Yeah, um, I don't know if I'm coming through for you all. Y'all are you're freezing up a little bit, but um, yeah, so I apologize that. if I miss some things. Um, but I, I just, I, I yeah, every, yeah, obviously. Uh, was the shared narrative that cops seem to access, right? Oh, now it's clear. Um, you know, there's this story of the crime decline, right, for which Bill Bratton takes personal credit um, in his areas of influence, right? Like police, you know, the crime decline happened because police did things better is, is their theory, right? That's kind of what they're working with. Uh, at the same time, you have this um, this decline of the of LA, uh, South LA's black population and an increase in Latinos, right? At the same time, um, you're having sort of this business transition where you want more outsiders to come in and they and they don't want to go to the, this this particular hair salon and they don't want to go to this liquor store. What they want to do is they want to go to 7-Eleven, right? They'll stop off the highway for that because they recognize it, right? So, I mean, they're wrapping all of this together in this narrative that is definitely a racialized story. And so, I mean, um, there was a great deal of talk about how, you know, the Latinizing present is way better than the black past, right? Um, and how, you know, the, the police are, you know, a big part of this and they're, they're picking and choosing as part of the reason that this is happening, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, they are in, I mean, I, I remember riding down the, the, the street with one cop um, and he told me that he could tell exactly who owned a liquor store based upon whether their, the windows were bricked up or not. And the windows that were glass, he said, were owned by Latinos who had come in after the uprisings. They didn't have experience with the uprisings. So they didn't see the need to make their, their stores, you know, riot proof, basically. Um, but the ones with bricks, those were owned by black people. And, and, and he would sort of laugh and be like, yeah, they're, they're, they're leaving soon, you know. Um, you know so, so various officers, and it wasn't a single person. It was, it was this conglomerate story that came together and made sense. And I think if you'd articulate, like, I fully expect many officers to be able to read that chapter and be like, "Oh yeah, that's totally what happened. This is this is this is what I understand history to be." And I think so, I, I, 
I think there's, there's uh, one more thing, Alex, if I can add. Uh, this sort of um, pressure to want to beautify the neighborhood uh, in the wake of the riots is a part of the, a larger story of L.A. I mean, if you look at um, the city's reinvestment in L.A. after the riots, you know, the redevelopment Los Angeles project, the like funding and the encouragement of a lot of businesses coming into South L.A., uh, you know, that whole era ushered in this new role for police to be champions of business in this way. And yeah. and it's it's very similar to the ways that they think about neighborhood improvement and the ways that a, the city development agency thinks about beautification and, and sort of modernization. So, you know, even though there may not always be these very clear connections at an institutional level, the, the language, the ideas are very, very similar. And they sort of come from this post-riot moment in the same way that the like the contemporary language of community policing does. Yeah. And they're elevated of, as experts, right? Oh, go ahead, yeah. Let me, let me ask uh, you just, uh, let me ask you, uh, wanna switch gears just a little bit to cover some other things. So a lot of the book's ideas are organized around uh, sort of including the raw uh, field notes in the text. So was that an idea that you started with? Did, did you get feedback from NYU Press or the, or the peer review folks about doing this? Uh, what, what was your goal in trying to frame it this way? I mean, uh, our, our Yodas, our inspirations for, for the book uh, primarily came from cultural anthropologists. I mean, um, Probably the most significant for us was Bourgeois and, and Schoenberg. They did uh, this, this book called Righteous Dope Fiend that was like part cultural ethnography, part journal, uh, what is it, narrative journalism kind of thing, like photo photojournalism. Really great book. Um, but that that book sort of um, brings you into this this world of, of San Francisco's homeless population and, and the drug using that happens there um, through this series of vignettes in, in their experiences. And they and they open every single chapter with one of these. Um, because I was mentioning earlier that the people who trained me were cultural anthropologists, that's just my mode of exposition is just anthropologically oriented. So I think that was always um, my preference for framing it that way. I think when it came to the time of the press, uh, yeah, Eileen had some um, opinions about having these lengthy excerpts that you know she was her words were you know they're not the most riveting so you might want to you might want to give <laughs> you might want to give the readers a little bit of prep you know so uh, Aaron Aaron and I tried to make sure that we prepped readers in the in the what is it the first few pages what is it called I'm totally blanking right now the preface the, pre the preface thank you um so we made sure to, to sort of uh, give readers a, a note about what was to come, that you would just jump into it like you do the deep end in, in a swimming pool and sort of figure out the, the way that the world is working, partially because I feel like that's the best way to understand an ethnography, is to get lost in the world and then to sort of like find your, find your, your swimming legs in the middle of the story, because that's how we do it as researchers. Um, two, you know, I just... I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, but I think that was the way to really have the characters who we got to know and whose company we enjoyed very much and who's, who we really owe our, uh, this book to. Um, we owe, I feel like that was the best way to sort of show them as complete people. Yeah. You know, from the captain who has, who has, um, who's in charge of this, of this leaky ship and to the members of the community who are, are very honorable, noble people, but at the same time, just very flawed and, and uh, very kind of uh, petty in a, in a lot of ways. But, but I think that's the sort of uh, scenario that we walked into. And, and if you don't see that through the field notes, it's difficult to get a sense of it. I think that was, that was the, those are some of the big motivators, I would say. I hesitate to even find anything to add to that, but yeah. Uh... And, you know, you get to see us also as flawed and petty people. You get to hear our voice directly, right? I mean, I think it's important that you recognize, you, the reader, recognize the difference in voice and style between the field notes, right? I mean, Danny paid attention to different things than I did. Um, and so when we're able to put both of them, and we, sometimes we collaborated on field notes. I mean, I don't know. Like, I would, every day of the week, I'd rather read 
you know, I mean, they, we polished them a little bit, but like, you know, um, raw data like that over a, a something that's been synthesized and filtered and, and you know, uh, just kind of reworked until it, it, it says exactly the thing. No, we, we set out field notes and then we interpret them below. You can come to a different interpretation. You're, that's, that, for me, that's a strength, right? I mean, argue with me over the data. Let's do it. You know, that's, that's kind of the, the fun part for me is showing the thing and then being like, yeah, and here's the way I'm interpreting this based upon the schema that we've talked about, you know? I think it adds a certain kind of, you know, methodological rigor in a sense, which is appropriate for an academic book. You know, I, you know, I read the book for, for Eileen after peer review, and I did think there needed to be a bit more of this contextualization, but I thought that the use of the field notes was, was, really, was really powerful. And, you know, there's often a, a critique of ethnography that, you know, how do we know any of this? And while field notes are not like independent data, they, they, it just adds a, a, some transparency to the, to the process, I think. Sure. Now, you, you all are both uh, part of this uh, critical police studies group at the American Society of Criminology. Uh, can, can you tell us something about that group and what, what your aspirations are for that? So we started in 2014 um, just wanting to get um, a cohesive group together of people who look at policing issues from a critical perspective. I mean, I think early on uh, we wanted to get people who come who came from all different disciplinary traditions, you know, um, people who are invested in sort of like the humanities approach, social scientists, um, activists was was uh, always kind of a dream, although we we never really got that many activists involved. Um, and at certain points we did, uh, but it was really to get folks in the same room who were who were looking at community or at, at policing issues from the same kind of angle. Um, a lot of times at a place like ASC, we're sort of shoved in some small corner of some random panel, and you never really get a whole lot of good feedback. Um, but we, we found that when we got into one room, all of us were sort of buzzing on the similar wavelength. It was a much more productive conversation. And, and then people formed relationships and collaborations, and that was sort of the entire goal. I think more formally what we would like to do is sort of think about uh, how we can expand. Uh, right now, there's some energy around uh, expanding towards uh, looking at critical policing, but from a perspective of the Americas, right? not just the United States, but looking more sort of comparatively about the region. Um, at the through LSA through the Law Society Association, we're thinking about forming an international research collaborative, um, mm. and through that, um, we we just sort of put open feelers out about this IRC, and there has been some uh, interest in potentially doing a, a special issue. So we we might have someone on the line who's interested in sort of leading that because we've always been looking for someone who's a little bit more senior to to sort of lead the charge. Maybe maybe not. We're sort of still in conversations, but the. The long-term goal is to formalize the group through something like that. It's still a special issue, uh, and then and then a special and then an edited volume of a book, um, but also to sort of formalize the meeting um, or formalize the group itself. You know, not just those, not just our friends. You know, but but also uh, people who are part of a of a more like coherent organization, uh, and and then can have a like a, a solid platform on which to sort of take stands. Um, collaboratively, collectively. And there are some graduate students who have, have gravitated towards it, which is what, what you want, right, is you want to be a home to support junior scholars so that there's a kind of viable career path for them in a sense. There's a, a community of scholars that they can be in dialogue with and rely yep. on for peer review, et cetera. We've always been very open to having uh, graduate students along. I think the numbers have, have sort of shifted since we've had, we've known fewer, fewer people who are still in graduate school, um, but you know, as especially when we get people like uh, the last guy who joined us in in, in San Francisco, um, people who drop in who are just interested by the name and the collection of words that, that show up in the in the uh, program, you know, that's that's essentially what what we want. We want to get people who are in there and feel marginalized, and they they find a home in our group. How are you relating to to the uh, the sort of growing popularity of, of abolitionist research and, and theorizing and, and activism? 
I know and that there that's... Is, and there is this prison abolitionist group at ASC as well. Yeah, they're big. They're big. Um, I know that there that Aaron has noted some interest because I think you know someone that that heads the group or something, right, Aaron? Uh, no, I just get his emails, Michael okay. Coyle. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean, I know that, that there is some interest in, toward, in, in sort of like maybe collaborating with them more, maybe doing something with them more formally. Um, at the moment, we haven't done anything, but that's that's uh, with them. But that's something that uh, we'd be open to doing in the future. I mean, you know, they this time around, they had a ton of panels and we struggled to put one together for ASC. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, what are you guys working on now? Um, I've, I've been spending my, uh, two, two big projects, I guess. That's, that's, that's wrong. I'm, I'm walking all that back. Um, I've spent a lot of my time in the past four years in Portland trying to, um, help out the organized left here. Um, you know, being a part of various organizations, trying to figure out what the ground landscape looks like. I mean, when we talk about police, we're very often talking about, again, pr suppressing progressive organizations. So it's also been a way to put, you know, kind of take the 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 lofty um academic ideas and put them into practice right and try to figure out what that looks like on the ground um not from the position of an observer but from the position of an actor um so that's been very time consuming but um in terms of projects uh i've been focusing on state violence um there's a paper we have under review right now uh should come out soon hopefully as my, as my if any reviewers are watching I, i'm we're almost there uh in theorizing uh police homicide and deaths in prisons and all this as as a not just a failure of the state but as a, as of a thing that should be added to the homicide rate and when you look we we're in the we're in sort of the still in the the plateau of the great american crime decline but like what's been missing from that is some accounting of the sheer number of police homicides and homicides by the state um which by every count that i can find are rising as a percent of those totals right so that's kind of lost. That, that's going up and our crime rate is going down. That's a very interesting um, juxtaposition right there that I think needs to be talked about much more often. Um, I'm also, uh, I've, I've sort of gathered the database. I'm interested in police union communications because if you want to talk about the id of policing, um, I mean, police unions, man, they're every time you want, you want to make structural change to police organizations. They don't happen mm -hmm. in community police meetings. They happen, they ha yeah, because they come up hard against the contract, you know? So, like, trying to figure out what their public statements look like, the way they're communicating with their um, their constituency. I mean, I know you just recently uh, had an experience with law enforcement today uh, that might that might fit some of those bills. Uh, but trying to figure out what they're like and what, and what they're about and being able to synthesize those things and talk about them, I think, is really important because it's we don't... The number of papers on police unions in the literature is minuscule. Mm -hmm. It's tiny. It's been neglected. So anyway, that, that's that's the goal. Uh, there, yeah. is, there is some stuff in the works, I can tell you. And I think we need to, to do some networking between uh, folks because I'm getting these inquiries and I'm trying to connect people some. But uh, yeah, I think that that's uh, that's really important. Danny? Um, I'm looking at uh, some work that I think really inspired me to go into graduate school altogether. All just looking at extreme violence. Um, I am am looking at mass shootings through like an intersectional lens. So specifically, I'm, I'm starting out with the Elliot Rogers shooting in 2014. Um, there's a lot of interesting things to say about his masculinity and what drove him to to, to kill. Um, his perceptions about his own identity and and what he expected out of life because of his class position as well. Um, but, but particularly as it relates to policing, I'm, I'm interested in why it is that so many mass shooters have numerous law enforcement contacts and very seldom get taken seriously until after, after these events. Um, you know, what, what, what is it about that? I, I mean, I've seen a lot of literature looking at, um, you know, like the, the racial halo effect that, that you have, you know, what, what sort of protective factors a lot of people have when confronted with police. So I'm interested in sort of connecting some of these critical race ideas to the um, missed opportunities we have with respect to law enforcement of mass shootings. Um, and that so that and then more broadly, I think um, I want to I want to move into comparisons with uh, mass violence throughout throughout the region and more in line with what Aaron's talking about, the role of 
that uh, that the United States plays in sort of perpetrating or facilitating mass violence in Latin America. But most of that is politically motivated, which is very, very different than mass shootings in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just on the state violence thing, you know, the, some of the public health people have sort of figured this out, right? They, they show that something like 8% of all homicides now are committed by police and that there are communities where it's well over 10% of all homicides are committed by police. So we've got to, you know, include that into our deeper thinking about, about uh, the violence of our societies and the role of the that's state. What, that. That's what kicked the whole thing off, honestly. Back in graduate school, I read an OC Register article of all the things um, that basically said that um, uh, between LAPD and the, L and the LA County Sheriff, they contributed 10% to the homicide rate uh, in, those, in those spaces. You're like, holy shit! That's <laughs> that's incredible. That's 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 ridiculous. Our calculations show that if if um, if the state were considered to be its own geo geographical place, its own state, uh, it would, depending on the year, dual California as the number one contributor to the homicide rate. Mm. Like that's insane. That is an insane thing. Well, uh, one last question, guys. Uh, tell me, tell me uh, what you've been reading that uh, that you want to recommend to your fellow criminologists. Aaron, you got a couple? Or honestly, um, I am definitely more in action mode right now. Uh, so we've been trying to fight. Uh, it's, I got a three-way fight as a blog is a blog that I'm really interested in right now. Um, and it's basically the right wing and the state and fighting both of those things. Um, you know, how do you do that? Well, you, you, you run jail support. You know, you support people who were at your actions and who got scooped up and you make them part of the movement and you help them through the court process. And I'm not a lawyer, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we can't provide them the physical and the, the, the sort of the political strategy that they need to get through some of these things. Right. Um, so things like that, that's been my what I've been really focusing on right now. So. Um, you know, I've been going back to basics, reading, reading my Marxes and my Cedric Robinsons and Bell Hooks and Angela Davises, but um, I have not been as up on the contemporary literature. So I'll let Danny answer those questions. I've got, I'm, I'm laughing because I've got three books on my desk that are going to give you an impression, but I, I want to make sure that, that you would know that these books are sort of contextualized by my research interests at the moment. So <laughs> one, of, one of them is Angry White Men. The other one is white fragility, and the last one is dying of whiteness. And all of these oh. sort of deal with <laughs> image of whiteness and gun violence in the United States. So <laughs> that's where. Well, you that's know, we're, I, in a, we're in a great moment right now around around theorizing around race, and I yeah. think that the Black Lives Matter movement contributed to that to that level of interest in the same way that it's generated more interest in policing because we've had this you know explosion in critical police research it just wasn't the case uh, back when I was a, a you know an assistant professor or an early associate professor so you know there's in a way certain works have been influential to the movement I mean when I talk to activists, in this generation, and I was like, well, what was the first thing you read that kind of motivated you to engage these issues more intensely? And of course, they mentioned the new Jim Crow consistently. And at the same time, as the movements develop, then we respond to those movements. They become a, a source of, of greater interest for us as research subjects. And, and hopefully, you know, publishers are more interested in publishing it and funders, funding research, et cetera. So it's interesting to watch the, the back and forth of those um, communications of, of ideas and, and action at work. Well, yeah. guys, I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time out to, to talk about this. And uh, for those of you who are watching, you can click on the circular box to subscribe to this podcast and the rectangular box will lead you to more episodes of the show and guys hopefully uh next time in in person over some beers with master sure, alex yes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>